Hello friends, this is Jim with Science Talk. I have an interesting report here uh, discussing the role of running water when it comes to determining the carbon budget as it impacts on climate change. Basically, new studies are showing that as water runs over rocks and soil and so forth, that that action could be doing some interesting things. So for example, rivers and streams are active players in the climate machine. They release roughly 20% of the CO2 levels emitted by humans when, they, when fossil fuels are burned or you take limestone, rock, and you make cement out of it. What does it mean by that? Well, as we're burning the fossil fuels, some of it gets sequestered into the ground, and we, in, in some of it, you know, used by the plants, others get sequestered, others, others uh, parts of it stay in the atmosphere, warms things up. Well, now it's turning out that if, if the CO2 that gets sequestered to the ground has some water over it, that water, the action of the water, especially with rivers and streams, could help break down whatever it is there, you know, with the rocks that they're in, particulate or organic matter, etc., and then re-release that back into the atmosphere. So in other words, some of the sequestration that we've been calculating might have been an overestimation. That some of it, that's what we thought was sequestered carbon ends up back in the atmosphere. So, we'll be reporting to you on several, about three studies here. So that's one study. A second study, which is entirely separate, found that dry riverbeds, you know, the waters and the gulches, the arroyos, that carry intermittent flash floods across arid landscapes could add up to as much as half of the global river network contributing to this re-release of uh, carbon into the atmosphere. It also found that the dry and parched plant litter in the riverbeds decomposes rapidly when rains arrive to add carbon dioxide emissions back into the atmosphere. Now, when we talk about uh, plant litter, uh, we use, use the, uh, the abbreviation POC, which uh, stands for Particulate Organic Carbon, as opposed to DOC, which is Dissolved Organic Carbon, such as if you see very brown looking water, that's due to a lot of uh, uh, tannic acids, tannins. The tannins contain dissolved uh, organic uh, carbon. So, and of course, that could also be a, a source uh, for carbon. A third study found that the CO2 is not the only concern as the planet warms up. And you've heard me discuss this with you uh, before. The world's ponds, lakes, and marshes could release significantly more methane. You knew that was coming, right? For every one degree uh, Celsius temperature increase, the release of methane, which is, which is, it does not persist as long in the atmosphere as does carbon dioxide, CO2, but it is a more potent uh, greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide because per molecule it traps more energy, CH4 does, than CO2. So for every one degree temperature in increase, one degree Celsius, Greenhouse gas could rise between 6 and 20 percent. That is not insignificant. Now, what are the purpose of these studies? Well, obviously, to get a better handle and, uh, on what's going on, get a better metric, and so on. Uh, such studies are intended to provide a more reliable basis for calculations that other scientists will be utilizing in their studies. So hydrologists from the, uh, from the United States report in the journal Science that they use decades of satellite data, ground measurements, flow studies, and um, some complex mathematics. Translation, 
uh, loads of calculus, loads of differential equations, loads of high-end uh, statistical analyses, uh, such as time series analyses, Fourier analyses, and uh, that's when you just need uh, loads and loads of computer uh, power <laughs> to, to crunch the numbers. So, what else uh, can we share here? Hamlin Pavelski of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, said, as we try to mitigate the effects of climate change, it is really important that we clearly understand where the carbon that we are emitting goes. And that requires us to accurately quantify the global carbon cycle. So by examining the running rivers and streams, this is a component in addition to everything else that We've been quantifying so we get uh, this extra piece of the puzzle to insert into climate modeling our new he continues our new uh, calculations help scientists better assess how much carbon dioxide is moving from rivers and streams into the atmosphere each year a team from australia and 22 other nations asked a slightly different question what about those rivers that don't flow most of the time the researchers report in the journal Nature Geoscience that they've looked at 212 dry riverbeds across a range of climate zones to sample the pool of dried organic material at risk of decomposition once it gets wet. And this is that this would apply more to POC as opposed to DOC, because DOC is dissolved implies it's already wet. Whereas POC is particulate waiting to become waiting to basically turn into DOC. But that's the, uh, the study that, dealt, that looked at the waters and the gulches and the arroyos. You know, dry uh, uh, most of the time, and then you get the flash flood uh, cruising through it. Taking, uh, uh, Nathan Waltham of James Cook University states that taking rivers and streams that only flow at certain times into account would improve estimates of the consequences of global climate change on carbon cycling, given that the extent of these rivers and streams will increase and periods of drying will become more prolonged than many regions. You have heard me state this often enough that dry areas, arid areas will become drier, more arid, wet areas will become wetter. It's kind of what uh, he is uh, alluding to here. And then, going looking at that third study. Another international team led by researchers from the Netherlands report in the journal Nature Communications that they collected data on methane bubbles from fishing ponds nearby, from post-glacial lakes in Sweden and forest ponds in Canada, then simulated lake behavior in a series of laboratory mini lakes in which they can control the temperature and then watch the methane bubble. Their hypothesis was correct. Higher temperatures meant more methane and at predictable levels. Before I continue, let me pause here for a moment. You see a lot of people say, well, there was no one around 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, uh, you know, uh, a million years ago. So how, we don't know what the temperatures really were. Well, you know what? Using isotopic fractionation as an example, as one, one type of methodology, and I did a video segment on isotopic fractionation, and I may actually do an update video on that to kind of revisit that topic. But, you know, we looked at, uh, typically looked at O18, O16 uh, ratios, uh, N15 to N14, C13 to C12. We look at these ratios in various organisms, various shells, and the differing ratios of, say, O18, O16 can translate into specific temperatures. How do we know that? Because we've done controlled lab studies. Oh, let's create these uh, conditions, and we see this ratio. You know, let's make this temp this the ambient temperature in our lab. And now let's measure the ratio of O18, O16 in the organism. And so we now have basically a calibration. So this is why we're able to reconstruct fairly accurately past climate. 
So when they say high attempts mean more methane predictable level, they're able to say, well, with uh, you know, at this level we have this much, uh, at this temperature we have this much level of methane, at this other temperature, etc., etc. That's how they're able to do this. We create basically calibration, kind of a metric, and then we say, okay, this is the, uh, the measured ratio. Let's look it up in the table. Oh, this measured ratio translates to this temperature. And you can then look at other isotopic ratios from other elements as a confirmation. So, going, so, uh, Sarian Kostin of uh, Radboud University stated, uh, never before have such unequivocal strong relationships between temperature and emission of methane bubbles been shown on such a wide continent spanning scale. That's significant. She continues, every ton of greenhouse gas that is emitted leads to additional emissions from natural sources such as met methane bubbles. Luckily, the opposite is also true. If, you, if we emit, emit less greenhouse gas and the temperature drops, we gain a bonus in the form of less methane production. Now, what is the issue that keeps climate so scientists, climatologists awake at night? Methane. We, we don't know how much is totally in the ground. You know, in the permafrost, circumpo you know, through Siberia, Canada, Alaska, uh, northern Scandinavia, in the uh, methane hydrates, clathrates, in the ground, in the, uh, in, in the uh, oceans, lakes, and so on. We don't know how much is there, but we do know it's being released. And now we want to know, what rate is it being released? Will this be a slow releasing? Or will this be the planet having a big methane burp or fart, in which case you have an enormous amount released into the atmosphere at a go? This is what keeps climatologists awake, because we don't know how much is there, what is the relate being released. We know it's very potent and could have deadly consequences, not just for human, but for aerobic life. This ties into positive feedback loops that you've heard me discuss with you before. More methane, more warming, more thawing, uh, uh, so forth, releasing more methane, etc., etc., and you ben basically have a runaway system. This is what has climatologists concerned. So basically, what the, the take home message from all of this is that rivers moving about um, help. Uh, you know, release uh, carbon back into the atmosphere. They do so by the, the, the process of just of the turbulence of the mixing, but at some point uh, they might evaporate and then it, uh, the, material, the carbon is sent back into the atmosphere. Or just, just by the simple matter of you have some uh, particular organic carbon material, it gets wet, it dissolves, and the carbon is uh, released. So we then add the CO2 and the CH4 into the atmosphere, increasing those levels, increasing the warming. So what we thought might have been sequestered is turning out to, instead of being a sink, is now a source for carbon. So this will have, this will help us construct better modeling, but there's obviously the, the concerns that are associated with this. So, um, Want to bring you a quick summary of those three reports. Thank you for your time. Hello folks, this is Jim asking for your help. I want to grow this channel significantly. I want to increase the number of people who subscribe to my channel. I want to increase the number of people who are supporting patrons on Patreon for this channel. Patreon.com forward slash Science Talk with Jim Massa. I do not receive funding of any sort from anyone. So the information I share with you is the information as found published in the peer reviewed journals. No propaganda, no BS, just the science. And of course I give you my interpretations and analyses based on my experience as a scientist. So please tell others of the work I do here. Tell others of my channel, share my videos, post them on other social media platforms. But we need to disseminate this information to more and more people, to a wider, wider audience. 
and I need your help in doing that. For those of you who are already uh, patrons and support me on Patreon, thank you. Thank you for your support and continued support. Together we can do this. So you'll find details in the description box below how to support me on Patreon. And thank you. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your continued support. It does mean a lot to me. We can do this.